Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you with us for Psychedelic Alchemy this evening. I'm Austin Pick, Director of Naropa Extended Campus, Naropa University's newly reinvigorated uh, Continuing Education and Public Programs Division. I'm also currently the Administrative Director for Naropa's new Center for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, the Center is launching many new initiatives, including our 10-month Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies, which is underway now, uh, this speaker series, of course, and more. Dates for next year's Psychedelic Assisted Therapies Certificate and other training opportunities will be released this summer, so be sure to stay tuned. I'll take a moment to introduce, um, if she's with us, our faculty co-director, Jamie Beachy. And I'm also uh, really happy to introduce our host for this evening, Andrew Schelling. Andrew is a longtime faculty member at Naropa University. He teaches for the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics and for the Religious Studies and Wisdom Traditions Department. Poet, essay writer, and translator of Old India's poetry, he has published more than 20 books, including the collection Wild Form Savage Grammar, which features an essay exploring the possible use of hallucinogens among Paleolithic artists and comes highly recommended. One of Andrew's recent titles is the folkloric account of linguists, rogue scholars, bohemian poets, and other coyotes, entitled Tracks Along the Left Coast, Jamie the Anglo and Pacific Coast Culture. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce and uh, welcome Andrew this evening. Thank you, Austin. Um, and welcome everybody to uh, the Center for Psychedelic Studies at Naropa University. Tonight we're going to hear a talk by Nicholas Powers in the Psychedelic Alchemy series. Um, title of his talk is Flowers in Gun Barrels. And though you may not recall precise dates or locations, that image, placing flowers in the end of police gun barrels probably conjures the late 1960s like no other image. Um, quick research I did shows that most of the photographs are from the grounds of the Pentagon in October 1967. That image, as I said, endured. Maybe an image that was less durable was a later attempt to levitate the Pentagon as a way of protesting the war in Vietnam. Um, before Nick starts talking, I'm going to sketch out a few details of kind of the ecosystem within which he is going to speak tonight. I consider this talk and this series, the Psychedelic Alchemy series, to be a bit of a homecoming. Um, I think few people recognize and few people talk about how Naropa itself really emerged from what I consider um, the first huge wave of psychedelic use in the United States. Um, the late 1960s, early 1970s were a golden age of psychedelic exploration. And one outcome of those kind of turbulent um, travels was the Naropa Institute, now called Naropa University. Um, you know, the use of psychedelics, particularly in the late 1960s, really brought about for many people a possible change in values. It really went hand in hand with movements like the civil rights, um, opposition to the Vietnam War, demands that higher education get real and address real issues. Um, I think at the core, psychedelics showed that you as an individual could depart from the self, particularly the socially constructed self that is based on fears and paranoias and greeds and desires, and that you could actually find a different orientation for the self, which would be more built on cooperation, on generosity, on friendship, on love. Um, that's what psychedelics showed could be possible. Could, however, is not necessarily a roadmap for making that happen. And the, what I'm calling the golden age of psychedelics was a very 
brief period, I would say less than a decade really, because many people realized that they recognized that values needed to be changed. They understood that they should be changed, but they didn't really have a clue how to do that. Um, you could develop alternative societies if you had a little bit of guidance perhaps. So explorers, psychedelic explorers, veterans of tripping, um, often found ourselves with no clear way forward from these powerful experiences. Um, when Naropa Institute began in 1974, a great many of the early faculty and early students were in some senses refugees from the uh, travelings of psychedelics and were looking for more guidance, more concrete ways of enacting the changes that they had seen possible through psychedelic use. Um, you know, it, it was a time when a great many uh, people turned to contemplative disciplines, turned to the arts, turned to a sort of back to the land homesteading, turned to a variety of practices that might give them better grounding since the psychedelic use had not the advantage of indigenous or traditional cultures, ceremonial context. Um, when Naropa started in 1974, founded by the um, exiled Tibetan Lama Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, Rinpoche being a title that means something like precious one. Um, in the early uh, summer of 74, when Trungpa gave talks, he actually swapped off talks with another teacher of the time named Ram Das, or I think he went by Baba Ram Das in those days. Ram Das had had an earlier lifetime, sort of the previous decade in which he'd been a guy named uh, Richard Alpert, who had been a psychology professor at Harvard. And he, along with a pal of his, Timothy Leary, began to experiment regularly with LSD and uh, bring a certain kind of rigorous study to LSD. And uh, out of their experiments, they realized that there was very little guidance for people who wanted the exploration. So Timothy Leary, a guy named Ralph Metzner and uh, Ram Das put together a book called The Psychedelic experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And it was sort of a rewriting of one of the only books on Tibetan Buddhism available in those days, the Bardo Todol, which they found in translation, and uh, kind of Americanized it, modernized it, filled it with ghastly demons like TV sets and advertisers and capitalists and car salesmen and attempted to get make something of a handbook for people who were traveling and going into these difficult realms to navigate. Um, the Bardo Todol, or more popularly Tibetan Book of the Dead, it really you know, could be tr translated or half translated as teachings on the Bardo state. The Bardo is a condition in Tibet uh, Tibetan lore means something like in between, and more popularly, it refers to the time between two lives. A person dies and goes through a regular journey that leads them towards a new birth or a rebirth. A little more esoterically, this book was understood as speaking to a condition we're in at every instant, that at every moment something in us dies and we have control over how to be reborn, that we can be between lives at every instant and choose in that next instant how to act, how to live, how to slough off outmoded social forms. So these were the kinds of discussions that were going on at the Naropa Institute in its early days. A couple of other faculty who were there were three I want to mention. The Jack Kerouac School founded that same summer by Allen Ginsberg, Ann Waldman, and Diane DePrimo, who were all veteran psychedelic experimenters, trippers of the 1960s. And, um, you know, out of their writings, some of the best um, 
poetry of the psychedelic era emerged. I'd recommend Allen Ginsberg's Wales Visitation, a landmark poem, which is then dated July 29th, 1967, and in parentheses, LSD. Uh, you could say that Naropa took that energy of the psychedelic explorations, the golden age, and maybe um, attempted to construct an institute based on what early visitor Gary Snyder spoke of in a landmark essay of his, Buddhism and the Coming Revolution. He said that the mercy of the West has been social revolution. The mercy of the East has been individual insight into the basic self void. And this is exactly what Trungpa and his many energetic students attempted to do was to bring together sort of Eastern wisdom, Western wisdom that had social change and personal insight at the core of it. Um, the view of Buddhism is that we do not need to invariably act on based on the three poisons as they see it, delusion, hate, greed, or in Tonka paintings, you'll see a little circle of a serpent, a rooster, and a pig, delusion, hate, and greed. No need to act on those when we meet other people. Instead of greeting people with our prejudices and our avarices, we can meet them with creative fearlessness and a little bit of generosity. Uh, so this is really the beginnings of Naropa University. Many people know the tale of its namesake, the abbot of Nalanda University, Naropa, who um, is said to have been a great scholar studying his books one night when he was surprised in his chambers by a crone who showed up magically behind him and asked him, when you read those books, do you understand the words? And Naropa said, yes, I understand the words and the hag threw herself on the floor laughing and chuckling and stood up and congratulated him and said, and how about the meetings? Do you understand the meanings? And he said, of course, I understand the meetings. And she threw herself on the floor, weeping and ripping out her hair. And he pulled her up and said, what's going on? When I said I understood the words, you were happy. When I said I understand the meanings, you uh, got incredibly upset. And she said, that's because you told the truth when you said you understood the words. You lied when you said you understood the meaning. And at that point, he set out on his own journey to find a teacher, Talopa, who could guide him. Naropa has often been presented as a sort of pedant or a bookish scholar, but I think maybe those books of his were really the equivalent of psychedelics. He had found ways to move forward, but he didn't really know the path itself. And so he had to find a guide. Tonight, we're going to have a temporary guide, Nicholas Powers, talking on flowers in gun barrels. All of you have probably seen Nick's um, biography, but I'll remind you, he's the author of The Ground Below Zero, 9-11 to Burning Man, New Orleans to Darfur, Haiti to Occupy Wall Street, this is published by Upset Press. He's an associate professor of English at SUNY Old Westbury. Uh, you can find many of his recent articles, pieces in an online magazine called Truth Out. He's a father, he's a hard worker, and uh, his research interests include surrealism, Marxism, feminist theory, African-American aesthetics, and uh, he teaches a variety of topics on those. So I'm looking forward to this talk. Please, everybody, welcome Nicholas Powers for Flowers in a yeah, Flowers in Gun Barrels. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for that very generous um, introduction. I almost was wondering who you were talking about. He was such a good guy. <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate it. And um, thank you, Naropa, for reaching out and for inviting me here. And for those who are watching and listening, just to kind of give you the, the structure of the talk, I'm going to use a bit of my autobiography as kind of a, a highway on ramp. So that when you listen to the personal stories, they're really ways of getting to a larger history and ideas that are much more important than my individual life. And you know, through then I hope that at the end we can have 
a, a kind of a good discussion about what the, the the meaning of these ideas and hopes are that I think a lot of us have inside of us, which is, you know, with, with the world that seems constantly on a knife's edge, how do we kind of pull it back um, for a hug? So with that, I'd like to share the screen and, um, you know, begin the, the presentation. So one of the earliest images that I saw of psychedelics inspiring <clears throat> an anti-war drive was the image of a flower in a gun barrel. And that image has been recreated and restaged in many different ways. And this is just a more modern image. And psychedelics today is selling us a dream. And when I look at psychedelic websites, I see lots of different titles from everything from say having sex on mushrooms to you know how to use vapes, uh, can psilocybin reduce the fear of terminal cancer patients, um, can psychedelics treat racial stigma, then there's always the legal aspects of the constant shifting landscape of laws to open up the doors for the mass use of psychedelics within the medical model. So we have policy in New York, researchers asking if psychedelics turn us into mystics. And we're sold a dream that psychedelics can lead to a transformation of our lives and a transformation of the world. And as I'm walking along and I look at my cell phone, of course, I see images of war pouring in from the newsfeed. And so one of the most startling images that came out recently of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine was of five men carrying a pregnant woman away from a missile blast. And I couldn't help but ask about that word transformation. How can we transform the consciousness of the world so that it stops the war upon innocence? How can we change the consciousness of a young man in a uniform so he does not think it is his highest duty to shoot a, a missile at pregnant women? And because I'm recently a father, I couldn't help but think of the heartbeat that was inside. So allow me to play. I couldn't help but think of the heartbeat that was inside of her, of her heartbeat, of the heartbeat of those men who were carrying her. And it was one that I heard and when I first listened to my son's heartbeat while he was in the womb, and I had an ultrasound picture, and he looked like a little seed growing inside of a cave or an astronaut floating in space, and I heard his heartbeat, and it was the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life, like a drum beat. And when I left the office, the heartbeat followed me, and it began to connect me to so all the people who I saw, all of whom who had heartbeats. And these thousands upon thousands and beyond them, the millions and the billions of heartbeats all rising into the sky like music, like Valentine love letters floating up into the air, like a song that we all could feel, but maybe not hear. And I thought how that heartbeat, that original pulse of life connects us even when we seem so different from each other. It connects those who are killing to those who are being killed. It connects the very poor, even to the very rich. It connects the racist to the target of his hate. And underneath the mask that we wear, there is that heartbeat. And that heartbeat seems to pulse like stars in space because there's this infinite cosmos inside of us that we can access. So then the question for me and for psychedelics is, how can we get to that infinite and how can it heal us? 
So allow me to pause this. So the how from the past. When I was in college, I came across how by Allen Ginsberg, and it was incredibly powerful and shaped my early mind. The poem, obviously, uh, is a 1956 poem. It was inspired, Allen Ginsberg was inspired by jazz, by peyote, under which the influence he wrote some of the earliest passages of how specifically the Moloch. And that when he was writing, it actually took Allen Ginsberg many, many, many times to get away from the robot voice, from the corporate voice, from the theocratic voice. He had to break out of all the other voices that were inside of him that he mistakenly thought were his and return to his own body, return to his breath and to use his breath as line breaks and to use his breath as a shovel to unearth and dig up all of the wild, sensual sides of himself. And in that way, he was very much like Walt Whitman. Ginsburg was very sensual, very democratic. And at the same time, maybe he's slightly different from Whitman, that he was more focused on the tragic violence that America visits upon people who are on the edge. And if one does just a very brief new criticism on Allen Ginsberg's how, what you see over and over again is an image of a mind that is opening up to the vast horizon of sensory experience and to the vast infinite and is nearly destroyed by it because as it grows, it has to kind of break through its outer shells. So the classic poem begins, of course, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connections of starry rain, machinery of night. So let me pause. And what you see in the yellow highlighted sections is a constant reference to the madness that accompanies transcendence. And that the madness is a healing insanity because one must pass through the membrane of mainstream thought to be able to transcend into higher levels of wisdom. And that for a brief transitionary moment that it could seem like you're going insane. So we see images of the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo, the machinery of night, floating across the tops of cities, bearing their brains with radiant, cool eyes hallucinating. So again, you know, what we see here is the bearing of brains, the, the sensitivity of the moist mind um, being exposed to ideas and truths beyond it. And so this is a poem to me, honestly, about ego dissolution. So I wanted to know what Allen Ginsberg knew. And so I began to take LSD in college. There was always a lot of it uh, flowing around. It was like confetti being blown through the hallways. And of course, at the same time, I was also reading Sigmund Freud's work because I wanted to understand what was happening in my mind. And so one of the classics ones was the ego uh, in the end. And I thought what was helpful in Sigmund Freud's ego and the id was specifically this passage, the ego. And from this ego proceed the repressions by means of which an attempt is made to cut off certain trends which have been shut out and stand in opposition to the ego. And the analyst is faced with the task of removing the resistances which the ego displays against concerning itself with the repressed. So I began to have this image of the ego as a kind of protective armor that was in sense of blocking some of the internal truths of my body, of my desires, of my secret hidden self. And, and the many psychoanalytic thinkers that came after Freud repeated essentially the same theme. Here is a small section from Freud's papers on techniques by Jacques Lacan. 
Uh, he was a French psychoanalysis who's credited for rewriting Freud. And here he, re he writes, the fundamental absurdity of interhuman behavior can only be comprehended in the light of the human ego. Namely that set of defenses, denials, dams, inhibitions of fundamental fantasies which orient and direct the subject. So again, defenses, denials, and dams, the ego is what blocks us. So when I took LSD, the spectrum of the five senses expanded. And not only did they make my eyes physically dilate, but they also made my mind dilate. And much like this painting by, uh, called The False Mirror, a 1928 painting by um, French surrealist, René Mar uh, Marguerite. And you see here that the eye, the pupil is surrounded by clouds, as if the clouds are the voices of other people being blown and reshaped by our internal wind, our desires, and how the infinite horizon is right behind the concepts that we use to think about life. And so both the physical and the psychological dilation of the self was captured in a beautiful description of the LSD trip by W.V. Caldwell in his uh, 1968 book, LSD Psychotherapy, an exploration of the psychedelic and psychoanalytic therapy. And so he wrote this of LSD. The drug tore off, tore off the protective layers of the ego, exposing to light subconscious emotions and thoughts that subjects had had but never dreamed of. The stammered in disbelief, is this really me? Ignoring the uncomfortable, uncomfortable fact that LSD had not put these things into their brains, but merely let them out. So when I first started to experience LSD, I experienced the oceanic emotions that Freud talked about, say with religion, and it felt that I was sinking beneath the surface of the self into this great expanse. And it did feel like I was drowning because I was still holding on to the self. And it was only when I was able to dissolve myself into the larger oceanic emotions and accept that these weren't things separate from me, but they actually were me, that I was able to go from fear and terror to euphoria. And I began to look at the world as this distant, faraway illusion that now that I had a great space away from, I could dive back in with a sense of joyful freedom, knowing that now I knew that there was a, a profound truth, that I was not, not that small little individual I within the world, but I was actually this part of a larger, beautiful, and infinite cosmos and that now I could go back into the world uh, feeling a great strength. Now, I think what LSD allowed me to do is what actually happens in psychoanalysis. Now, obviously in traditional psychoanalysis, the therapist is not gonna like put an LSD in their palm and hand it to you. But what they do in a talking cure is that they first begin with free association, mostly, which is, I'll read here, this method according to which the voice must be given to all thoughts without exception, which enter the mind. So you freely associate. And as one freely associates, you begin to bypass or to pull down the defensive structures of the ego, which is, I'll read here, the defensive pole of personality and erotic conflict, and it brings defense mechanisms into play. And maybe even beyond the ego, the superego, which is its role in relation to the ego is that of a judge or a censor. The forming of ideals is one of its functions, and it is the result of the internalization of prohibition. And so what I experienced in LSD without necessarily the therapist in front of me was transference, which was the actualization of unconscious wishes, the infantile prototypes that reemerge in our experience with a strong sense of immediacy. So this comes from uh, um, Language of Psychoanalysis by Laplanche and Pantales. It's pretty much a classic in the field, but it pretty clearly described what I was experiencing in, in LSD was alongside some of the experiences that happen in therapy. Now, a little bit more up to date is the neuroscience of psychedelics. And probably one of the more famous spokesmen of this is Michael Pollan, whose book, How to Change Your Mind, is obviously a titanic 
shift in public conversation. And, you know, he was spent four years or so researching and writing this book. And then when it came out, it just kind of hit at the right time. But in a talk called Big Think that you can see online, um, he actually described the section in the material fleshy gooey brain called the default mode network, which really functions a lot like the ego in Freud's psychoanalysis. So he actually says right here, to the extent the ego can be said to have a location in the brain, it appears to be in the default mode network. It can be very self-critical. It's where self-talk takes place. And when that goes quiet under LSD, the brain is let off the leash because those ego functions regulate mental activity. The brain is a hierarchical system and the default mode network appears to be at the top. It's kind of like uh, the orchestra conductor or corporate executive. You take that out of the picture and you have an uprising from other parts of the brain that don't usually talk to each other. So here's my connection. I say that one is never working with a default mode network, but a cultural default mode network. And I'll read here, the cultural default mode network is not an individual, but collective. The CDMN is created by institutions and ideology. So Pollen's metaphor of it as a corporate executive tells us that the structural hierarchy of the brain function inevitably reflects the social hierarchy and that the I rising from this ever active synthesis takes shape and exists within social rules. The rewards and punishments from family to school to job tie the neurons of individual brains into a rigid knot along a chain of associations that bind us into an imagined community. So what happens when those neuron knots kill the very people who've internalized it? The ego ideal is the cultural default, default mode network. And so the ego ideal here is an agency of the personality resulting from the coming together of narcissism and identification with parents or their substitutes or with collective ideals. And as a distinct agency, the ego ideal constitutes a model to which the subject attempts to conform. And I'm sure we've all had this experience of saying, looking in the mirror and not actually seeing our actual real physical reflection, but seeing an ideal reflection of who we want to be. And that image of who we want to be doesn't come organically from within the body. It's something that we must learn. It comes from the outside. It is an ideal that then shapes our ego. And then we attempt desperately to conform to it. In a really powerful book called The Feminine Law, Freud, Free Speech, and the Voice of Desire, 2016 book by Jill Gentile, uh, she wrote that the ultimate consequence of psychoanalysis um, is ultimately to actually dismantle the hierarchies because it, um, in the transference and free association are psychological mechanisms which actually bring down through talk the ego and the ego ideal and the superego. So here she writes, I've been writing for years about the emergence of a patient's sense of agency and how patients claim their ability to use signs and symbols to signify their desire and take ownership of their desire. And a patient claims and a patient claims for their free speech. And the relationship between a patient and analysis is hierarchical, but so much of that work is to dismantle that hierarchy. So the image that I left college with is, and I'll quote, use Freud's quotes here, that the mind is like an iceberg and it floats maybe with one seventh of its bulk above water. And above water, we have the superego, which is the kind of the judge, the censor of the ego and the ego itself, which holds a lot of our libidinal energy and the beneath it, the id. And then Freud has this other great quote, which says, no matter how much restriction civilization imposes on the individual, he nevertheless finds some way to circumvent it. So the image I came away with in college with LSD and psychoanalysis and the protest was that human beings are like walking volcanoes and that in some ways we're always leaking lava whether it's neurosis or symptoms or repetition convulsion and that the ego ideal if it's too heavily energized can actually turn against us and I thought this quote by Freud was very telling the more man controls his aggressiveness the more intense the aggressive 
tendencies of his ego ideal turn against his ego. It's like a displacement, a turning around to bound the self. But even normal morality has a harshly restraining and cruelly prohibiting quality. So I began to ask, is my ego ideal, my judge, my sergeant, my teacher, my priest, my cop? And what I've seen over the course of reading history is that the image of the ego ideal shifts, but its function stays the same. So here's a powerful image from the 1651 book, Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, in which you see so many millions of people creating society and the top is the king's head and he has a sword and a scepter and the crown, the symbols of authority and violence. And against the, again, the ego ideal is created through this looking up at the kind of religious nobility. Uh, here within Black Skin, White Mask, the famous book by Franz Fanon, again, you see a black man with a white mask because that is the ego ideal, that is the ideal self in a white supremacy. And then this ego ideal that is experienced by minorities is exactly as Freud said, it is so highly energized that it winds up looking and censoring and judging one. And then you can actually feel this separation between your real life and this ideal version of yourself that is in a sense a kind of a poisonous reflection. So W. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folk, a 1903 classic, said this, which I think really links up with Freud's ego ideal, that the Negro is gifted with second sight in this American world. And it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on an amused contempt and pity. And one feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And so I think W. Du Bois then was followed up in 1990 by Black feminist thought, uh, a classic by Patricia, Dr. Patricia Hill, Hill Collins. And she said here, the dominant ideology of the slave era forced the creation of several interrelated and socially constructing controlling images of Black womanhood, each reflecting the dominant group's interest in maintaining Black women's subordination. And so growing up, I remember these caricatures these ego ideals, because, you know, as a man of color, you're supposed to make it, but you didn't want to be an Uncle Tom. You had these kind of conflicting ideals. And we kind of ran away from the Uncle Tom caricature because he was seen as a sellout and at the same time had to navigate the desire, the very real desire to escape from poverty, to escape from segregated neighborhoods. And so it was a very tricky line. And then at the same time, there was the caricature of the brute, right? So here is the black and Latino brute, which is a thug caricature. And we constantly grew up with movies. There was a run of hood movies in the 90s and early aughts. And Menace to Society is one of the most famous ones. And then here is another scene from Training Day. And this uh, shows you Mexican gangbangers. And so basically what you see here is a constant kind of repetition of this image, which was in a sense a kind of American ego ideal. And those of us who are of color had to constantly navigate, push and pull, tug and war uh, with these ideals that were thrust upon us all the time. Women of color, um, one of the classics was the Jezebel caricature. And again, we had to constantly navigate. Um, and I saw so many of my friends wanting to enjoy their bodies, but not wanting to play into the Jezebel caricature. So one of the ways that uh, psychedelics liberated me is that in the psychedelic state, I could actually escape, however briefly, from the ego ideal, the kind of poison in the brain, and go into a world where color was really an aesthetic experience. And in the bright lights, we were all silhouettes dancing to the music, and it seemed briefly like there was no difference between us. We were all shadows dancing in the light. And at the same time, as you can see over here, um, you know, you may not be, hopefully you can see it. It's uh, the image of me with a red shirt, but I had dreads and dreadlocks were a way of me anchoring myself into a deeper tradition beyond white supremacy, beyond capitalism, 
and anchoring them in a sense, almost like tree roots, searching for a deeper nourishment um, in the history of people of color. So I left college and when I became, when I went to graduate school, I encountered firsthand the nightmare of history. I went to the Graduate Center, which is on 34th Street, and I came there in August 2001. And then September 2001, and shortly after arriving in New York, where my family was, where I was born, I woke up one morning to see 3,000 people die. And when the towers fell, that it sent an earthquake through all 8 million of us and the millions who were watching on TV and the billions who were around the world. And it was my first experience of having trauma in my body that I couldn't get out. I walked past the rubble of ground zero and I smelled the kind of chalky Ajax smell and I knew that some of the air that was going into my lungs was also the ashes of the dead. So years went by, um, not actually years, so maybe a year or so went by and I began to intern uh, for the Village Voice. And when I was working at the Village Voice as a reporter, I still felt the helplessness of 9-11. All I wanted to do was go out and try to stop what happened to us from happening to other people. And one day when I came to uh, work, I saw images of people holding up babies uh, on rooftops so that the passing helicopters could maybe take them. And it was images of New Orleans. So I went down as a reporter. And of course, you know, I went there like two to three days after the, the levees broke and people were wading through the water. Uh, this was one of the gentlemen I met. The homes were on fire and the city was drowned. Uh, we saw way too many people uh, dead, bloated, floating in the river. And on the boats, we had to go past the floating dead to try to help those who were still alive. And one of the realizations was how little we could actually do to help. So, you know, me and a few people who I met there, uh, we did help. We did get some who were stranded, like this gentleman who uh, was on crutches, he was on diabetes, I believe. It was just in a bad way. And we got into a hospital and we got as many as we could out, but you know, the boats were too few and the people were, were very many. And I left there not thinking that I had done anything great, but it showed me how helpless I was and it actually increased the amount of trauma that I was carrying in my body. But I still felt this relentless need to try to go out and do something. And so in 2007, I went to Darfur. And as I was driving to the refugee camps, uh, you saw the rubble, the relics of war, this old rusted tank. And of course, even now as I'm talking, I, I imagine years from now, there will be old rusted Russian tanks in Ukraine. And all around the world, there's these relics of war. And I went to the refugee camps and I talked to women who had been gang raped. I talked to men who had bullets still in their bodies. And when I came back again, I had, my body was a sponge soaking up their stories. And then finally I went to Haiti after the earthquake. So a few days after the Teutonic plates shifted beneath Port-au-Prince, I went there to, again, try to help give out humanitarian supplies. And what I found were people who had been shot in, in the streets as the rest of the families were scrambling over broken rubble to try to get whatever food, supplies, anything they could get to get them through the next couple of months because it was gonna be very long and hard and people were already hungry and scared. So I came back and, and I was this, just this infinite blackness. That's what my soul felt like. I didn't even feel sad. I wasn't depressed, I just felt numb. I couldn't feel anything. Friends shook my hand, they took me out for drinks, they, they congratulated me, they honored me. I couldn't feel any, it was like listening to a very far away conversation. And I was suicidal for about a couple of months and I 
began to listen to music so from the civil rights movement and I began to take a psychedelic. And when I did, a little bit of light started to come in to my life. And I began to weep bitter tears. And I was grateful because feeling pain meant that I could feel something again. And so what I, what psychedelics taught me was that the trauma of other people can pour into our bodies and get lodged underneath the rib cage and the heart and the liver and the kidney. It can get deep inside the mind. And it stays there almost like a chunk of ice. And if it gets so heavy and so cold that it begins to freeze us before we die. And so we are almost dying before we die. And that what the psychedelics did is they thawed out those voices that I was carrying inside of me and they thawed out the sense of shame and helplessness. And I was able to pour them out. So psychedelics saved my life. And they taught me how to return to the body. And after my experience through those first difficult 10 years of the 21st century, I began to look at how in a very different way. And I remember this one line from uh, towards the end of how, where Allen Ginsberg wrote, I wanted, I, I always wanted to return to the body where I was born. And I realized that Allen Ginsberg, who started off as kind of, you know, this middle class, you know, bourgeois kid, um, then kind of through the transformation, the alchemy of psychedelics transformed into a man who was very comfortable with himself and his body he returned to his body. So he let his hair grow. Uh, he was more mischievous, more creative, more hilarious, more, uh, with, more, with more humor. And I credit this to the psychedelics because this is what happened to Albert Hoffman on Bicycle Day in 1943. And he wrote, I could enjoy, this is when he first intentionally took LSD. I could enjoy the unprecedented colors and plays of shapes that persisted behind my closed eyes. Kaleidoscope, fantastic images surged in on me, alternating, variegated, opening and then closing themselves in circles and spirals, exploding in colored fountains, rearranging and hybridizing themselves in a constant flux. Every sound generated a vividly changing image with its own consistent form and color. And yet two years after he invented LSD and took it intentionally, the US bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so at the very same time that this incredibly powerful chemical that alters human consciousness came in, human consciousness had achieved a historic turning point that we now had the ability to destroy life on the planet. So when Allen Ginsberg wrote Powell in 1956, this was years after the US dropped the atomic bomb. And I think that you can see in how his reaction to, and in a sense, disgust at the militaristic patriarchy and capitalism that had taken humanity to the point where it could destroy itself. And so he used the, the ancient name, the ancient god Moloch as a kind of figure through which to represent this horrific new world system that was threatening life on the planet. And so let me just read a, a few lines of it, specifically the highlighted ones. It goes, Moloch, the incomprehensible prison. This is the last stanza. Moloch, the crossbone soulless jailhouse and Congress of sorrows. Moloch, whose buildings are judgment. Moloch, the vast stone of war. Moloch, the stunned governments. Moloch, whose mind is pure machinery. Moloch, whose blood is running water. Moloch, whose fingers are 10 armies. Moloch, whose breast is a cannibal dynamo, Moloch, whose ear is a smoking tomb. Let me go here. Moloch, whose fate is a cloud of sexless hydrogen. And the last highlighted line. Moloch, who entered my soul early. Moloch, in whom I am a consciousness without a body. So here we see one of the earliest psychedelic criti criticisms of the war machine and casting it as this demonic God that was part of child sacrifice rituals in the ancient world, where children were being uh, 
kind of given over to this God. And so I think he's using the image of this God, one to obviously a, a cloud of sexless hydrogen. So this alludes to the hydrogen bomb. But when he goes, Moloch entered my soul early, Moloch in whom I am the consciousness without a body, that I think that Ginsburg is invoking how the ego ideal of a patriarchal military um, funneled and fueled by capitalism is creating a, a images of masculinity that winds up turning young men into mass murderers. So there was this animation um, from the movie uh, How of Moloch. And let's just see a little bit of it. Moloch, i cui occhi son mille finestre cieche. So you see the image of this kind of demonic god chewing this young man. The red flames of war, sort of kind of masculine, looking at all the children and taking the innocent children and then trans and then as the people willingly sacrifice their babies they throw their kids into this great god's throat and the babies then are transformed into soldiers and given weapons and an ideology and they go off to march in the bloody war. Ginsburg um, pushed against Moloch with sexuality. And so within Howell is this opposition against Moloch with the joys of the body. So it's really important that in some places he, and this is what actually made the, the, the poem um, illegal. Um, you know, there was a huge court case because it was considered an uh, obscenity. Uh, so here he goes, uh, who let themselves be fucked in the ass by saintly motorcyclists, who screamed with joys and who blew and were blown by those human seraphim, the sailors, caresses of Atlantic and Caribbean love, who lost their love voice to the three old shrews of fate, the one-eyed true of heterosexual dollar, the one-eyed true that winks out of the womb, and the one-eyed true that does nothing. I'm going to skip a line. Who caught Populated ecstatic and insatiate with a bottle of beer. Go down to this next line. Who's fainting on the wall with the vision of the ultimate cunt and came eluding the last jism of consciousness. Who sweetened the snatches of a million girls trembling in the sunset and were red eyed in the morning, but prepared to sweeten the snatch of the sunrise, flashing buttocks under barns and naked in the lake. So here is this very kind of Whitman esque invocation of the joys of the sexual body. And this is an incredibly opposition to the burying of the body inside the soldier's uniform and of replacing the, the, uh, the genitals, you know, the clitori, the, 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 the penis with weapons um, through which ejaculation is, is achieved with the firing of a gun. And the bullets are supposed to represent the sperm. So for me, the generation of 1968 um, was incredibly important because they were, in a sense, returning from Moloch back to the body, hence the long hair, hence the, the, the kind of syncretic uh, religion of New Age, hence the psychedelics, hence the free love. And this was something that um, more intelligent writers picked up on. So Warren Hinkle um, wrote in the so Social History of the Hippies, 1967 um, essay, the utopian sentiments of these hippies were not to be put down lightly. Hippies have a clear vision of a psychedelic community. It embodies a radical political philosophy, communal life, drastic restriction of private property, rejection of violence, creativity before consumption, freedom before authority. They take LSD and marijuana. They enjoy sleeping nine to a room and three to a bed. They seem to have free sex and guiltless minds and raise ch healthy children in dirty clothes. Uh, similar things were talked about with others. I think uh, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, which is a classic, again, 1967 essay by Joan Didion, who also went to hate Ashbury. And she had maybe a slightly different take, but I think it's relevant. 
We were seeing the desperate attempt of a handful of pathetically unequipped children to create a community and a social vacuum. And once we had seen these children, we could no longer overlook the vacuum, no longer pretend that society's atomization could be reversed. So for her, she saw that these are the symptoms of a broken society and that hate Ashbury could only exist because in some ways life in America could not truly exist. And then finally, Noni in, in the Street, 1972 by James Baldwin. And he wrote, I next came to San Francisco at the time of the flower children. Their flowers had the validity, at least, of existing in direct challenge to the romance of the gun. Their gentleness was a direct repudiation of the American adoration of violence. And this historical wheel had come full circle. The descendants of the cowboys who had slaughtered the Indians, the issue of those adventurers who had enslaved the blacks, wished to lay down their swords and shields. So this was, you know, some of the most celebrated writers of the time trying to take stock of the revolution that was happening in the street. And then, of course, this is what Andrew spoke about earlier. Um, this is the um, famous 1967 photograph from the Levitate the Pentagon March, in which you see this young man uh, putting a flower in a gun barrel. And this is one of the most dramatic images of a new consciousness among the youth trying to escape Moloch and trying to not just uh, win this war with violence, but actually win the war against violence itself. And what we see is that at this time, many other groups were also trying to return to the body. So here you see a Black Panther rally. And again, you see the Afros, you see the celebration of dark skin. Um, you see people trying to run away from the ego ideal of trying to fit into mainstream America and to celebrate Blackness. And this is actually, again, one of the most powerful um, crystallizations of this transformation was made in this um, essay, 1971 essay called The Negro to Black Conversion Experience by uh, Black psychologist William Cross. And again, you know, you could see in the illustration the kind of corporate man being transformed into a brother wearing a dashiki with his Afro out. And William Cross made it really clear that what he saw in this transformation was that there was a kind of pre-encounter phase where, you know, people of color kind of live in a state of innocence. People maybe are unaware at first, you know, it's when they're early, when they're very, when they're young, when they're children. And then some encounter happens, some experiences forces them to realize that they are Black within a white society and that their skin carries a symbolic burden. And they go through this experience of an immersion within Blackness to create value, to tap into the long-standing traditions that allow one to fortify the self. And in that, they wind up celebrating Blackness and in some ways um, uh, kind of casting out any of the attempts to buy into white society. And so it's very FUBU, it's for, for us, by us. And then finally, they internalize this and they're ready to rejoin society, but with a healthy, strong self that can withstand the prejudice. And then the last stage is internalization and commitment in which one sees that the struggle they went through is also a struggle other people are going through and they're willing to commit to radical social change. So that was the Negro to Black conversion experience, what he saw what was happening for Black people at the time. But this wasn't just happening for Black people. Here's an image of the Stonewall riots leading to the first uh, Pride March, Gay Pride March. And again, you see people trying to return to their bodies, no longer wanting to hide in the closet. And I, my thesis is that they were also going through, I would say, a kind of closeted to Pride conversion experience from a closeted gay to a, a pride, prideful gay and lesbian conversion. And they were going through a similar process um, through their sexuality. And I think also the Vietnam vets who threw their medals also were going through a conversion experience. And many of them, when you see the hair grown and the flowers in their, in their clothing, again, what you see is that they were trying to return to their bodies. So why are we struggling so much to constantly get out of the mirror? And one of the consequences really comes from our human evolution. And there was this book called Human Evolution and the Origins of Hierarchies. And uh, he wrote, 
The hierarchies in humans rest upon radically different grounds from those uh, uh, hierarchies among primates. The behavioral and cognitive specificity of modern Homo sapiens has evolved in Africa between 250,000 years ago, uh, gave us an enhanced ability to coordinate conflicting perspectives on objects and concepts. I would say that this was obviously the beginning of enough behavioral sophistication that we can have egos, ego ideals, super egos, et cetera. And he talked about a U-shaped history of hierarchy. So when humanity began with pri primal physical dominance, it's kind of what you saw, you know, what you see at a zoo, you know, very physical, who can physically dominate. But once we began to evolve to have higher mental cognitive abilities, we did transition into this kind of egalitarian tribal society. But our ability to mirror each other gave us the possibility to create vertical command hierarchies that led to the state. So you hear this picture in one of the caves, uh, it's a prehistoric painting of the cave in France of uh, paleo paleolithic warfare. But then you see it contrasted against the modern state army where you see lots of young men. Uh, many of them are different colors. People are coming from different neighborhoods, different backgrounds, but they're all dressed the same. They're mirroring each other. And in this book, Imagined Communities by uh, 1983 book by Benedict Anderson, he has this really beautiful pithy quote where the fellow members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, but or meet them, but or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. It's the power of the image. This is something noticed in ancient times, but in the, the classic book Poetics by Aristotle. And he says, the instinct of imitation is implanted in man from childhood. And one difference between him and other animals being that he is the most imitative of living creatures and through imitation learns his earliest lessons. Notes on the state of Virginia, 1787 by, Je by Jefferson. Man is an imitative animal. This quality is the germ of all education in him. And to return to Lacan, and I'm actually only gonna read um, this part here, uh, the mirror stage, which manufactured for the subject, caught up in the lore of spatial identification, a succession of fantasies that extends from a fragmented body image to a form of totality that I would call orthopedic. And it assumes an, off, an armor of an alienating identity. And so here again, you have seen this in children all the time that they adopt the image of what other people are doing. And yet, as we grow from childhood to maturity, the reality that human beings are living mirrors seems to become more and more tactile as we adopt the armor of our nation and we adopt the armor of our class. And soon our bodies are trapped inside the performance of an image that is becoming more powerful than the body upon which it rests. And finally, the 1967 book, Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord talked about societies where, I'll read this, modern conditions of production prevail and life presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has moved away into representation. So he saw modern media as a river of images that in a sense sweeps us away like a river will sweep away a leaf in the fall. And of course, probably one of the most classic images of being trapped in the modern media mirror comes from the 1999 movie, The Matrix. So what does the return of the body look like today? The reason I began with the 1968 generation is you know, really for one simple reason that um, many of them are entering, entering their older years and many are getting to the point where they're passing on. And so there's this beautiful image that I, I saw and I wanted to share with you of this couple who met at Woodstock, which my own mom had gone to. And now you see this couple had recreated that pose of Woodstock again. And I think that we've gone past the place where we just can easily criticize the 68 generation for their blind spots. And I think the question for me now was, what can we learn from their valiant effort to overturn more Moloch, to stop the war machine? And we are now in a new wave of protest of people trying to return from their bodies, uh, I'm sorry, return from their images back to their bodies. And so we see people at Occupy, Occupy Wall Street trying to return from the American dream, which have really failed them, especially after 2008. 
back to their bodies. We see in Black Lives Matters people of color returning from this false image of a post-racial America, especially during the Obama years, back to their bodies. We see the Me Too movement. Again, women are kind of returning back, you know, from this image, uh, from basically being targets of male supremacy, back to their bodies and trying to re-empower themselves. We see the movement of trans pride and trans visibility all around the world. And we even see moments of intergenerational solidarity. So one of the most beautiful examples I saw of that is when uh, the kind of global rock group U2 had a pretty big hit uh, called Love is Bigger Than Anything in Its Way. They didn't appear in the video, but they actually used the video to highlight trans youth and non-binary youth in Dublin. And um, it was an act of giving their privilege, giving up their platform so that um, these youth can see themselves um, as the handsome and beautiful uh, youth that they are. So how do we go from mushroom clouds to magic mushrooms? We all know that there's a brewing civil war in the US and we know that internationally there's war in the Ukraine and Yemen, Syria, the Northern Triangle, there's a huge drug war in Mexico. We all know that the American dream has trapped us in a, a kind of a mirror of affluence, but that that mirror is also leading that, that affluence, the engine of capitalism is leading to global warming. So all of us who are trying to buy into the American dream may find ourselves like in Hurricane Katrina on boats rowing out of our expensive homes into a wasteland. So psychedelics makes a big deal of set and setting. And it's true, Psych psychedelics with a proper set and setting can change culture, can change lives, can take the mask off. But number two, what's missing is a third term in which it's the container, in which the trip arrives at a more holistic and social transformation. It can't just be about individual therapy. And I would say that that container is psychedelic socialism. And for me, the definition of psychedelic socialism is using entheogens to seize control of the means of producing the self away from violent hierarchies in order to return to the communal body. So as we are going into the psychedelic renaissance, we are hitting some bottlenecks. One is that the medical model is really the tip of the psychedelic iceberg. Most psychedelic use happens privately or at festivals. And it will continue to be so because um, currently, and possibly for the near future, psychedelics may not be accessible to wide masses of people uh, medically. That may or may not change. But as of now, most use is privately or at the festivals. But more importantly, even when psychedelics becomes legalized and businesses start popping up and there's this kind of gold rush to cash in on psychedelics, it may be skewed to the middle class and the upper class as boutique therapy to help them withstand and survive and thrive within a capitalist society at the very edge of climate change catastrophe. But the poor, the masses of people in the shanty towns are going to be left behind. And that's the other bottleneck. So the one promise of the, of the medical model and I'll read it for here, is, is to acknowledge that psych psychedelics can maybe heal us from the human condition. So reading here, the price we pay for our power to create civilization is life trapped inside the mirror of others. And lost inside reflections, we wage war against innocents who appear distorted in our minds. And the deepest healing that we can offer is a consistent return to the body, the communal body that we all share. So in my fantasy life, I would think that a, a good president would help us inaugurate a, a sustainable civilization. So I always think about this um, African-American economist named uh, Heather McGee, who wrote this book called the, the Sum of Us and what racism costs to everyone. And basically, she basically pointed out that one of the consequences of anti-Black racism is that Americans are often have an allergic reaction to welfare, social welfare, like Medicaid for all, universal healthcare, free college, funding for mass transit because um, those who are racist see as the benefits of government going to the undeserving poor, like Blacks, Latinos, Asians, even the white working class poor. So I would imagine a President Heather McGee who sees the tragedy of racism as something that not just affects people of color, but all of the people in the United States would help us pass this. 
the Albert Hoffman Sustainable Civilization Act of 2025. And just to read it, whereas patriarchal militarism, poverty and global warming are existential dangers to humanity, the democratically elected president, Senate and House have found that it be resolved. It is the duty of the federal government to create sustainable civilization, A, to fund a mental health infrastructure employing psychedelic therapy to cut the cycle of intergenerational poverty, to combine universal basic income and a festival culture to minimize social hierarchy and the human tendency to tribalize and wage war, to create millions of highways jobs and the global green deal to reverse global warming and end poverty, and to secure for all people of the earth life for generations and generations to come. So maybe it's making churches into psychedelic therapy centers. Maybe it's also having a social, global social anti-war movement where we all take the courage of this one Chinese man who stood in front of a tank as they were going to Tiananmen Square to kill students. And maybe it is listening to poets like Rainar Maria Rilke who said, the work of the eyes is done. Go now and do the heart work on the images imprisoned inside of you. And this image here is the image of an eyeball, but the veins of the eyeball look like trees. Because I think vision is rooted like a tree inside the heart and its roots suckle at the deeper waters of our soul. And for me, I know this intimately because recently, in October, my mother passed and I was blessed to hold her hand as I heard her heartbeat starting to slow down. And I know that she gave me my heartbeat and I was able to give my son his heartbeat. And I know again that that heartbeat, that common link pulsing in all of our bodies is a truth that psychedelics shows us. And if we follow that heartbeat, it brings us to the youth, the children of Ukraine who are struggling to survive underneath a barrage of bombs. The youth in Syria who are scared and screaming for home. And the youth all around the world who are hungry here in Yemen, looking for food on the ground. And I know that heartbeat connects us with people who we've never seen even if that person is also the child lost inside of us. That's the truth of psychedelics. And that's where we can begin. So thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, that was terrific. And uh, really nicely skillful use of the images to bring history to us and some good words of encouragement. Thanks so much. Um, let me just say we, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so now would be a good time for people to start if you have questions for Nicholas to put them into the little um, icon at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A, and I'm going to um, pick out questions and um, read them to you directly, Nicholas, and um, you know, see what we've got here. Um, let's see, maybe I'll read uh, a first one here. How do we return home? Womb of life from where we belong, the source, mother. Um, I know you spoke a good deal about, um, you know, feminist interventions into liberatory movements. You even talked about feminist interventions into a psychoanalysis. I'm curious, you know, following off of this question, if you have any, um, you know, particular sense of uh, the womb, the mother, and um, how that might fit into the psychedelics world. That seems to be something of the question here. So as, as, a, as a man, psychedelics have allowed me to open up the lid and look inside. And one of the, the great gifts psychedelics has given me consistently 
is to embrace the reality of who I am, which is larger than the, the, the kind of I, image of the ideal man, which is in a patriarchy, basically kind of a more warrior ethic, very aggressive, very dominant. And that when I think about myself and about other men and the reality of most men in the, who I meet, that we're very complicated. There's lots of layers inside of us. And that, um, and kind of the Freudian model, which I think thankfully has been kind of proven a little bit outdated by, by the more kind of recent um, generations of psychoanalysis is that, you know, the, I, the idea that going from a boy to a man means that you have to separate yourself from the feminine within you. And, uh, you know, more recent scholarship that says, actually know that, that, that those uh, identifications with women actually stay with men. And oftentimes we have an ambivalent relationship to it because it allows some of our most intimate relationships with ourselves and other men, but it also is sometimes a source of distress. And so for me, I see psycho, uh, psychedelics as a way of breaking the bottleneck of masculinity within a patriarchy as a way of releasing the reality of who men really are. And that's why it's, it's, a, it's a much more euphoric experience. Now, it doesn't mean that the behaviors, the kind of typical masculine behaviors are somehow like, you know, off the, off the shelf, but it just means that they are now balanced with a deeper reality rather than kind of being the goal that we measure ourselves against. And so uh, for me, it's, it's what, I, what I would say is that psychedelics heal men in some ways from a kind of hyper-masculinity and allows us to actually experience the reality. And I think anytime we get closer to, to the reality of a thing, uh, the more sustainable life we have. Yeah, I'm wondering if some of your reluctance to embrace the um, therapeutic model of psychedelics is because of its embeddedness in capitalism and a sort of patriarchal, patriarchal and hierarchical, um, you know, mode of control. Yeah, I mean, I think the the kind of traditional psychoanalytic model um, can is kind of in a way based on hierarchy and it can kind of reinforce reinforce that. Now there are obviously so many different models now there's relational psychoanalysis, et cetera. Um, and there's been a lot of it's not even supplemental work anymore. It's where the field is going. The field is going towards more exploring, you know, it explored femininity under you know capitalism. Now it's exploring masculinity. Some of the really good books came out in the past like 10 years. And now it's exploring more social justice and race. So, um, you know, I think the field is actually going into a much more healthier place. Uh, but I also know that, it, to be honest, psychoanalysis is a very small culture within the larger sphere of the United States. And I, and I just hope that some work can be done to bridge that world with other parts of the, of, of the culture. So some of the deep lessons that it has can actually go ahead and influence more. Yeah, my understanding is that Freud was very afraid of psychoanalysis being taken over by a medical institution in America in particular. And there's that marvelous book by the poet H.D. in which Freud says, you're my descendant, you're my heir. It's really the poets who are going to carry on this work, not the medical establishment. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I think Freud's ultimate vision was that 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 the truth of, of our desires um, sometimes needs to be, you know, obviously curtailed for the sake of civilization, but that civilization, especially um, in his later book, Civilization, civilization and its, its Contents, that, um, that there is a radical energy that can overturn and sweep away some of the most prized edifices of society. And he saw the, bent, the, the powerful good of that, but also the powerful evil. So obviously with the rise of national socialism. And so Freud was, was in a sense advocating for his whole life for people to speak out their truth in therapy and live their truth as much as they could without harming themselves and others. And he knew that this truth was often in opposition to social mores and codes of behavior. But he also, as a kind of a apprentice anthropologist, knew that a lot of societies were based on fictions and lies they were only recently made up, even if they convinced themselves that, that history had gone back into time immemorial. So as a kind of apprentice anthropologist, he knew the societies were oftentimes relative. 
and, and he was a cultural relativist even before that term came out. Um, so yeah, I think he looked towards the arts, even though he himself, he appreciated art. I don't think he had an artistic temperament, but I think he saw in the artist that same spirit that he had, which is people who were willing to rebel against the dictates of a society. Um, and now, and last thing I would say, as a Jewish man who was facing anti-Semitism, uh, you know, his brother was attacked by a mob. His father was often uh, assailed on the streets. I think he saw um, civilization in a very ambivalent way. Um, and he saw that it could be that a whole government could be based on the on the lie of racism. And, and so he was, I, I think he was always, in a sense, rebelling against the worst aspects of civilization. Sure. Uh, a couple of people have weighed in with a few reservations, and I think maybe I'll read one of these here that is fairly articulate. It has to do, you know, tangentially with what you were just speaking of in terms of violence and prejudice. Um, so the question here is, how can we explain those instances where psychedelics or people's in deep relationship with psychedelics have been implicated in various forms of violence? And this person, um, you know, brings up the Om Shirikyo, a Japanese death cult known for LSD use and sarin gas attacks. Charles Manson, um, abusive ayahuasqueros, which I haven't heard of, but, you know, it does seem that even the world of psychedelics can be, um, you know, painted in these various ways. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, that, that when I was reading W.B. Caldwell, he said, he said very clearly that there are some definite risk of psychedelics. One, you know, if you have some underlying conditions, you could really, in a sense, you know, kind of like have a personality disintegration. But more than that, he said that it's really possible to, to become a, a megalomaniac because when psychedelics dissolves your ego and expose you to both the, in, the vast internal world and also the external world that was in a sense filtered through the ego and was at a safe distance, that instead, instead of the ego becoming humble and small and in a sense dissolving, the ego can actually inflate exponentially. And so you began to say, I am the universe. I am God. And I, you know, I've had friends who, I've never had this, but I, I have had friends who very clearly told me that under the most extreme place of, a, of an acid trip, that they thought that they were a religious figure. So, so there is a danger in that kind of megalomania, right? If you don't have a proper guide and container, but then to more specifically answer the person's question is that this is where I think set setting, but particularly container. If you have a theological container, and um, and you enter a psychedelic state, you can really believe that the message that you're receiving from whatever God or spirits that you're praying to or think you're in connection to is real. And if that uh, spirit, if that God, if those ancestors are telling you to, um, you know, unleash um, sarin gas in the subways or to start a cult and to you know, Charles Manson to attack the wealthy or celebrities or specific targets. It is more, it is easier for a mind under the influence of an LSD trip to accept that as true. And so I really think that one of the things that, you know, for us to put out is that one has to have not only trusted guide, maybe a network of verified guides, but also a container. And for me, the one that's worked the most is artistic, primal, but also atheist and materialistic. I don't believe in an afterlife. I don't believe in God. I don't believe, I don't, whether it's Thor or, you know, Osiris or Jesus or whatever. I don't believe, like, that's, and at least it keeps me at a certain degree immune to the idea that I'm getting a message from another world that's telling me to possibly act out in very harmful ways. So listening to you, you know, describe the container in this way, the container is not a neutral thing. The container is already loaded with its preconceptions, with possible bigotry, with possible megalomania, as you spoke of that. So um, any thoughts about how the containers for psychedelics into the future can avoid some of the worst abuses or the, you know, most disastrous elements that crop up in our society? Yeah, I, would, I mean, for me, I would always, my container is the there are no gods, no master, and to always simply return to the body, to the heartbeat, 
and to always return to the body sweating around as it dances around a campfire, a fire, a blaze, or inferno, uh, what the heart feels like during meditation. What are, what are the authentic internal images, memories, and emotions that come up and through the body as one is going through that trip? And to learn from that rather than trying to take ideas, images from the outside in. So if I were to boil it down, I would say, trust the body and go from the inside out rather than from a text or any kind of theology, whether it's indigenous, monotheistic, don't care, don't trust it. Don't go from the outside in, go from the inside out. And I think that you'll hear and experience that heartbeat that actually connects everyone on a body level. And since we all share that, that I think is the safest container that we can have and possibly the most powerful one. Thanks, that's very sound advice, I appreciate it. And I think at this point, we've about run out of time. Do you have any closing remark you'd like to make, Nick? I just say thank you everyone for taking the time uh, to Naropa and just follow your heartbeat. Yeah, thank you. So follow your heartbeats. Um, thank you, Nick, really appreciate your talk. And um, thank you to the uh, Center for Psychedelic Studies at Naropa for hosting you. <laughs>